This integral is insane. The final boss of integration. I'm going to use this chance to present the beautiful Feynman's technique of integration, which is most people's favorite integration technique, including myself. This integral is so difficult because there are so many problems going on. First things first, we have the arctan, the inverse tan. And this is a function we know how to differentiate very well. But when it comes to integrating it, we resort to integration by parts, so we shift to differentiating it instead. So keep that in mind. Second, the input is not x, it's 1 over x. So this reciprocal input adds an extra layer of complexity. Then everything is squared to make it worse. And let's not forget that this integral is improper for two reasons. First, we have infinity in the upper bound. And second, we have zero in the lower bound, which causes a problem because our input is 1 over x. So the question now becomes, does this integral even converge in the first place? Where do we even start? Let's begin by calling the integral i, as if that's going to make anything better, right? We will go ahead and use Feynman's technique of integration, which some people like to call differentiating under the integral sign. What's the idea of this technique? Before we start with it, let's decompose the square we have into a product of two equivalent terms, like this. And then we'll introduce two parameters, a and b, such that we have this function, i of a and b. The original integral is now a specific case of this, when a and b are equal to 1. So this is the question we're aiming to solve now. You may be wondering, the question we started with was already too complicated and difficult, so why would we generalize it? Actually, this is going to make the integral easier to solve, and here's the idea. We will differentiate this function i of a and b. But this is a multivariable function. So what variable should we differentiate it with respect to? Actually, we'll do both. So we'll do d by dA of i and d by dB of i. So we'll take those two derivatives of the integral we have. We can switch the derivatives and the integral like this. And then this can be thought of as a double derivative, and it's usually expressed as d squared over dA dB, like this. So now we have to take the partial derivatives with respect to A and with respect to B of this product of two inverse tangent functions we have inside the integral. How can we do this? d by dA of the inverse tan of A over x is 1 over 1 plus the argument squared, but then we have to use the chain rule. We have to multiply by the derivative of the argument which is a over x. But remember, the variable here is a, not x. So the derivative is 1 over x, like this. We can expand the square, multiply top and bottom by x squared, and then cancel an x term like this. So that's d by dA of inverse tan a over x. Of course, d by dB of inverse tan b over x will be very similar. So the integral becomes the following. So this looks much easier than the original question, right? Let's see what we can do. We have x squared in the numerator, and the denominator is a product of those two irreducible quadratics. So now we'll decompose this using partial fractions. We'll have ax plus b over the first denominator plus cx plus d over the second factor in the denominator. I already have a previous integral question, which was a bit challenging, and we went through a full partial fraction decomposition in that one. So I'm not going to delve deep into this, but if you try solving this for a, b, c, and d, you will find that a is equal to 0, c is also equal to 0, leaving you with b and d, the constant numerators you'll find that b is equal to a squared over a squared minus b squared. Of course, don't confuse the capital A and B with the lowercase a and b. 
And then capital D will be B squared over B squared minus A squared. By A and B here we mean the parameters we introduced originally. Okay, so let's now decompose the integrand into its partial fractions. We'll get the following. Notice that I factored out a denominator of A squared minus B squared, and this is exactly equivalent. How does this help us? Notice that the integral is now solvable because we have inverse tan situations. If we divide the first integrand by a squared top and bottom, we'll get this. And we'll do a similar thing for the second integral. We'll divide the top and bottom by b squared. Why? Because we want to make the denominator 1 plus something squared. 1 plus an entity squared. Because this reminds us of inverse tan. Let's see it more clearly. Let's group x over a into 1 squared and x over b into 1 squared. And then we can solve this by a substitution. For the first case, we will use u equals x over a. And for the second case, we'll use u equals x over b. But let's not confuse the substitutions. And what would help to avoid this confusion is to split the integrals like this a difference of two integrals, and we'll do the substitutions separately. So for the first case, we have u is x over a, du is 1 over a dx. Our variable now is x, not a. So business as usual. We get 1 over u squared plus 1, and dx becomes a times du. Notice that the bounds of integration remain from 0 to infinity. For the second copy, we also have x over b as another variable, call it w, and then dw will be very similar to the first case. So we can substitute w squared in the denominator, and dx will be b times dw, and of course the bounds will stay from 0 to infinity. So now we can integrate this very easily. The first integral becomes a times inverse tan of u, and the second one becomes b times inverse tan of w. So let's resubstitute u and w in terms of x. And let's not forget that this was a definite integral from 0 to infinity. So we have to apply the bounds. Now, technically, we should be taking a limit here. But the question is already complicated enough. So come on, the mathematicians in the comments down below. Cut me some slack. Let's assume that the limit is just implicit here. Okay, It's implied. We're taking the limit as x approaches infinity. We know that the limit as tan inverse approaches infinity is pi over 2, and tan inverse of 0 is just 0. So this works out to be the following expression. We can factor out a pi over 2, factor the difference of squares in the denominator, and cancel out the a minus b terms, leaving us with pi over twice a plus b. So are we done? Unfortunately, we're not quite done yet, because yes, we did solve the integral, but this is not i of a and b, this is the partial derivative of i with respect to a, and then the partial derivative of i with respect to b. So now to get i of a and b, and then substitute a equals 1 and b equals 1, we need to integrate back from this second derivative of i to find i. So how can we do this? We have to take two integrals to undo the derivative with respect to b and then undo the derivative with respect to a. Let's start with this integration, integrating it with respect to b. This will undo the derivative with respect to b, leaving us with d by dA of i. Okay, So we're going one step back from the second derivative towards the original function. The integral is easy to do. Pi over 2 is just a constant. We can take it outside. And then integrating this with respect to b gives us the natural log of the absolute value of a plus b. But wait, this is an indefinite integral. So we should have a constant of integration. So let's not forget to add the plus c. But wait a minute again. We're integrating with respect to b. So for all we know, this constant with respect to b can be a function of a. So we can't really call it c as in any integer or any real number. We have to be general and careful and call it f of a because it can actually be a function of a 
since we did the integral with respect to b. So we have to be general. Let's distribute the pi over 2. And this gives us d by dA. So now the next step is to integrate with respect to a, giving us i of a and b. And then finally, we can substitute a equals 1 and b equals 1. But there's an evident problem here. We don't know what this f of a is. So how can we integrate it? To find this f of a, we'll have to compare this expression we have with d by dA of the original i of a and b we have at the very top. How can we find d by dA of this integral on the top? Well, we've already discussed this. We'll take the partial derivative of this i of a and b, and the partial derivative will be swept inside the integral, resulting in this integral over here. Right? We already did something very similar before when we did the double derivative. But this is just a single derivative with respect to a. Okay. Notice that when b is equal to 0, we will have tan inverse of 0 inside the integral, meaning this entire integral will vanish. This is very important because it shows us that if we substitute b equals 0 in the second copy of d by dA, we must also get 0 because these two are equivalent. So we have pi over 2 times the natural log of a plus pi over 2 f of a equals 0, which gives us f of a equals negative the natural log of a. So we did it. We found f of a. And we're now ready to take the integral with respect to a to go back to i of a and b. But we have two natural logs here. And if you have some expertise with calculus, which I'm hoping you do, because otherwise you must be in no man's land by now. So assuming you do have some calculus expertise, you must know that to integrate the natural log, we'll need to use integration by parts. So that will be a pain to do twice. Let's use a property of logs to express this as a single logarithm. We have a difference of logs, so this will become the quotient of the inputs, like this. We can separate the fractions, and this will reduce to 1 plus b over a. So this is a little easier because we have one log to integrate, not two. So i of a and b is the integral of this with respect to a. So we'll take the pi over 2 outside, and then we'll worry about the natural log, which, as we agreed, will be integrated using integration by parts. So u is the natural log, dv is just dA, so v is of course a, and du is the reciprocal of the argument. But we have to use the chain rule again. The derivative of 1 plus b over a with respect to a is negative b over a squared like this. So b comes to the numerator, and we can multiply the a squared with the denominator, resulting in a squared plus ab, like this. So we have all we need to go ahead with the integration by parts formula. We have uv minus the integral of v du. So that's uv, a times the natural log. And then we have minus v du. Notice that the du already has a negative sign. So this minus becomes a plus. And then we integrate b over a plus b. Why? Because v is equal to a. So this cancels out with a in the denominator of du. I hope you're still keeping up. So we have this integral to do. b over a plus b with respect to a. This is very easy because it's another natural log. It's b times the natural log of a plus b, like this. But once more, this is an indefinite integral, so we need to add a constant of integration. And remember, just like we did last time, this may very well be a function of b because we're integrating with respect to a this time. We can't assume the constant of integration is a real number only. It may be a function of b for all we know because b is treated as a constant in the a world. So we have to be general and careful. Okay, so this is i of a and b. But now we have a problem of this unknown function g of b, which we need to figure out. How can we do this? 
we'll substitute a certain known value of a or b like we did last time but we cannot substitute b equals zero this time because this will get us g of zero and g is an unknown function for us so instead we will substitute a equals zero because this will also make the original integral vanish so if you substitute a equals zero we must get zero for the entire integral so doing this notice that this first term cancels out because we have a factor of a and we end up with pi over 2 b times the natural log of b plus pi over 2 times this unknown function of b and this must be equal to zero so we have g of b equals negative b times the natural log of b right and now we can substitute this back instead of the g of b and finally we have an expression for i in terms of a and b like this and now we're ready to substitute a equals 1 and b equals 1 to arrive at an answer for i of 1 and 1 which is our original difficult troublesome integral substituting a equals 1 and b equals 1 we have pi over 2 times the natural log of 2 plus pi over 2 times the natural log of 2 which is pi times the natural log of 2 so i of 1 and 1 is equal to pi times the natural log of 2 which means that the integral from 0 to infinity of the square of the inverse tangent of 1 over x is pi times the natural log of 2 and finally we're done